All right. Well, I think we should get going. And uh, of course, people may join uh, in, in the middle. Uh, but thank you, all of you that have made it. It's a pleasure today to introduce the speaker for our second Solutions That Scale seminar. Uh, Martin Powell, uh, who is the Chief Sustainability Officer of Siemens USA. So Martin has a very impressive and, and wide-ranging background. Uh, he earned a degree in civil and environmental engineering from the University of Dundee in Scotland, uh, spent time working as a consultant in the rail industry, which maybe he'll say something about, uh, worked for the Energy Saving Trust and the Institute of Sustainability at Cambridge Management and Research Limited, uh, served as Deputy Mayor of London for the Energy and Environment during Boris Johnson's uh, term as Mayor, and also as a Special Advisor to Mayor Mike Bloomberg uh, in his role as the Chair of the C40 Cities Group. He joined Siemens in 2012 as the Global Head of Urban Development Practice and spent time working with mayors of 100 different cities provide technology advice and support uh, for those cities as they tried to meet economic, social, and environmental targets. In his current role as Chief Sustainability Officer for Siemens, he's in charge of driving the corporate programs to achieve the company's goal of carbon neutrality in 2030. Um, today, he's going to tell us some of uh, what he's thinking about and been doing over his career on the urban challenges related to sustainability and climate change. So with that, you know, it's a very great honor to introduce Martin and I'll hand it over and uh, hear what he has to say. I'm looking forward to it. Great, thank you very much, Steve. Um, uh, welcome everyone, hello. I'm gonna share my screen. I've got um, a lot of slides, but you'll be pleased to know they are entirely uh, pictures. And um, so please don't panic. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, Steve gives me a thumbs up. Yeah, great, that's, fun. that's great. So welcome, um, I'm gonna take you through a journey um, that I've been telling probably for a, a, a decade, probably, possibly longer, about the challenge that cities have um, as we move forward with some really difficult mega trends that seem to impact us. And I always like to start by asking everybody to think about the city they're going to live in in 2050. So if you picture in your head what you think your city would be uh, looking like um, 20 years, 30 years from now, um, I, what I can tell you is that you'll be consuming about 20% um, of the energy that you consume today you'll be sharing the same space with twice as many people. Okay, that's actual space, living space, road space. Um, twice as many people will be moving around your city um, and you'll be consuming about 50% um, of all kind of material use that we consume today. And I can say all of that with quite a great deal of of certainty and, and that's really the story I'm going to tell. But how do we get to that future with the sort of pressures that we face today? And I go back to 2008 when we had one of our first biggest re recessions. I remember seeing this article and um, this was at the great bank bailout and it really struck home with me, you know, this, this really isn't about bailing out. This is really about survival. And I look at, you know, how people dealt with science at that time. You know, we really didn't listen to our scientists. We arguably still don't. And maybe this is a language issue. Maybe this is a, a, an issue of um, understanding what this really means or whether, you know, each of us have a role in solving climate change. You know, what can I do? barely nothing, so I'll just carry on as I was. So this is really about engagement. Um, this is really about thinking about how we um, could all play a role in dealing with um, our carbon emissions. I look at what's happened in the last year. I know we've all been going through it, um, lockdowns and um, 
we've stopped traveling, um, we've stopped going to the office. Um, I've been living in New York for three years. I'm now back in the UK, but um, I was at the epicenter of coronavirus in May last year in New York and the streets were empty. And at nighttime, I looked out and all these office buildings were just lit up. And I can tell you, because I went to speak to a couple of the, the janitors and I said, is, is the heating on as well? And they said, yeah, you know, we, we don't turn anything off. We just kept it all because security are walking around or the odd person was going in and out of these buildings. And it suddenly made, made me realize that our carbon emissions, we had an opportunity to completely slash them with our office buildings, turning off the lights, turning off the heating or cooling, um, and in fact, you'll find the numbers show that our emissions are still going up, even in the last 12 months, that the um, CO2 in our atmosphere is still climbing. Um, our energy use in big cities um, went slightly higher because the office buildings were on, but we're also consuming more energy at home with all of us in lockdown and all our computers plugged in and heating and lighting on and everything else. Um, we're going to head into a recession and I really don't, I'm not trying to depress you. I'm just uh, saying that with the way that the economy has contracted, this is, this is going to be tough on a lot of people, but actually this is an opportunity for us to think about how we save money. Um, if you can cut your energy bill by 20%, that's, that's a meaningful saving for a lot of families would bring a lot of people out of fuel poverty. Um, and that leads me into this big climate change wave that's coming behind that, because that's really not gone away. Um, but what COVID and what tightening our, our budgets is going to, to uh, help us with is understanding what it is we need to do, what we need to do better. When our uh, traffic in New York went to zero or very few vehicles on the road. Um, the air pollution in New York um, has never been better. The levels um, are safe, meeting all sorts of good limits. Whereas on a normal day in New York, with normal traffic, um, like many cities in the world, they're all in breach of air pollution limits. So we have an opportunity as we tackle climate change to actually clear up some of the ills and worries that we had um, already existing in our, in our big, big places. So let me just take you through some mega trends. This is a, a simulation. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner, there's a clock, uh, years going up. 1970 is the year I was born. I know I look younger than that. Um, you can see we're racing through to 1990. This is where we began to set some limits. And what's happening to this simulation, this is created um, by the world's largest supercomputer, is this is what's gonna happen to global surface temperatures if we carry on emitting carbon at the rates that we're doing. By 2050, this is where the Paris Agreement will have kicked in and we will have achieved amazing results in cleaning up our energy supply and figuring out all of the pollutants um, and greenhouse gases that we're putting into the atmosphere. Um, but if we don't, this is the, the future we're heading to. And it looks pretty drastic, but this is, you know, the best supercomputer in the world uh, simulating this out to 2100. So I'll let you take a deep breath because this is quite powerful stuff. Um, my worry at this in this year is that my you know children's children or their children will look back and wonder what why we let this happen you know why we didn't stem this and i think the us coming back into the paris agreement is an enormous step forward um, the us is a global powerhouse of finance of innovation of technology and it's got its importance in solving this is is understated so it's, it's pretty, pretty powerful stuff. Um, urbanization is happening. I hear a lot of companies talk about 
people moving to cities. Yeah, we'll build a few more houses. It's all fine. I hear a lot of tech companies talking about how IoT and software and all these wonderful things are going to solve this problem. And they absolutely have a role, no doubt. But this is Jakarta and Delhi in the 70s. This is the same city and its population increased by the late 80s, 90s. In the year 2000 and 2010. And there's a clear trend here, you know, these cities are growing, they're sprawling, they're becoming more dense. Um, software won't fix this, you know, this is about infrastructure investment, but doing it in a way that limits how much additional energy we consume. And that's an enormous challenge we face as more and more people move to these big cities. Density is an enormous issue. This is Mumbai, 34,000 people per square kilometer. So this is a pretty dense place. Just to, many of you may have been to London. It's 4,500 people per square kilometer. So it's nearly a tenth of the density. Um, so if you've been to London, a, a picture what Mumbai must uh, look and feel like. So how you move people around the city, how you uh, consume, energy, water, how you get rid of waste, all of these things, they're fundamentally different problems. And this is the point I'm trying to make is that cities have to deal very locally and very individually with these main issues. And the other big mega trend is demographic change. Um, we're living longer, um, we're living older and we need to address this because it's not just living longer, it's changing the shape of our workforce, it's changing the, um, the way that people move and use our cities, the way they think about um, society in general, and therefore the city has to adapt to accommodate this very uh, different uh, workforce. And I'll give you a little test. So in the year 2000, there were 2 billion children on, on earth okay so it's just the number of children uh, how many will there be in the year 2100 okay so 2000 uh, year 2000 just 2 billion children i'll i'll help you uh, because we asked the typical uk audience and that this is how they voted uh, so by the year 2100 will there be 1 billion children 2 billion 3 billion or 4 billion. So I'll let you hold a number in your head, have a think about it. Uh, and the answer is 2 billion. So over the course of this century, the number of children on earth will remain the same, but we will add 3 to 4 billion people to our population purely because people are living longer. Okay, so we're in a very aging workforce, a very shrinking, uh, sorry, very shrinking workforce, very aging population. Interestingly, if you asked a monkey the same question, this is how they would vote. You like that? And this is just proof that a monkey is four times more likely to get the right answer than a typical UK audience. So there you go. Poverty, terrorism, urban unrest and flooding are increasing in the biggest 60 cities in the world without exception. So this is more than a trend. This is now an absolute certainty. Um, they're flooding because we're putting more and more hard spaces in higher and higher dense places. Um, the fact that uh, rioting and urban unrest is increasing is simply because uh, we have increasing populations moving far more quickly uh, into the same space. And this creates uh, huge amounts of tension. And poverty, child poverty, fuel poverty, however you want to mention poverty, uh, is increasing. Um, you can argue that the overall um, societal uh, benefit of living in a city is improving, um, but that doesn't hide the fact that we're still putting more and more people into, into poverty. The issue is that our cities are impacted today. This is New York in 2012. This was after Superstorm Sandy took out the whole of Southern Manhattan. Um, modern solutions, the way of thinking about energy, isolated energy islands, distributed energy grids, um, 
this would uh, avoid this entire issue. Uh, it would help shift us to renewables. It would take pressure off the grid. It would uh, arguably make energy more affordable. Um, and it opens up a world of possibilities. And again, with, with the US back in the Paris Agreement, I can definitely see this moving forward. Um, this was uh, Bangkok. Um, uh, they, they had a horrible flood, huge loss of life. Um, but because of this flood, um, the manufacturing facilities shut down and the price of a hard drive globally went up by 40%. So this has a massive economic impact because uh, businesses were unable to produce the hard drives, they were unable to, to get them out. This impacts you and I for the next computer that we buy is, is therefore more expensive. Um, as a result of this, some big companies thinking of locating to Bangkok decided to go to other places. So cities have the challenge of being able to deal with this kind of flooding, recover from it quickly in order to remain and thrive economically. And I think this is a very, very important message as we move forward. This is um, a common daily view in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. Um, they have a torrential rainfall two hours in the middle of the day. Everything stops, everybody waits. And then you know, when the flooding slowly subsides, everyone moves on. Um, interestingly, most people travel on the road like this. Um, it's a city about the same size as London, a little, a little smaller than New York. Um, and if you think about New York and London, how many train stations they have, you have 12 or 15 reasonably big hubs, and then many smaller hubs. Well, this is the only train station in Ho Chi Minh. So the challenge of some of these cities in the developing world um, is that they've got to get the basic infrastructure, the basic modal share right. And they've got to get more and more people moving into public transport. That's the only way you're going to deal with growth. You're going to keep people happy, keep people in your city, keep people moving and the economy thriving. So there's a lot to balance. Um, this flooding isn't helpful given that 75% of the world's cities live in exposed coastal areas. So these increasing numbers of storms and, and weather events are simply going to continue and if not increase. This, this is the city we want. Um, we want green spaces, high quality green spaces where we can sit with our laptop and eat a sandwich and you know chat with friends. Um, and it looks idyllic and it looks very simple, but um, you look at any big city, it's taken them a hundred years to get to this, uh, to get rid of the pollution in the air, to get rid of the sewage on the ground, to ensure that the trees are there and not some uh, shanty village or some really tough um, built up area. Protecting these kind of spaces is critical for the big cities to survive, to keep it, not just to keep people happy, but to keep the whole ecosystem in, in balance. But cities are reacting, and this is where I begin to pivot this talk and um, hopefully um, sound a little bit more optimistic about the future, because my, my basic thesis is that cities will solve the climate crisis, not the federal government, not even the states. It'll be urban areas, local governments, mayors that will figure out what they have to do and make the moves to do it. And the way I want to describe it is to start with this story. This is um, Pope Sixtus VI. Um, I have to say that sober. <laughs> Uh, he placed uh, six obelisks into the city of Rome. So these beautiful, big, tall obelisks. And you can see them there on the left-hand side. And actually, you can see them there today. So this city was founded on a very bold vision, six obelisks, and you see the city of Rome today. And after the Great Fire of London, back in um, the late 1600s, this was the, the new plan for London, and it looked very similar to Rome at the time, a big, bold plan, but this is what they built. And it was completely different 
completely different, no, nowhere near the plan. And this is the beauty of cities, is what worked for Rome worked for Rome. What works for London works for London. It's down to the local governance. This is the governance structure in London. Um, the mayor is somewhere in the middle of that. But if you want to get anything done in London, these are the organizations that will be involved, that need to be involved, that um, there's advisory bodies, there's committees, there's all sorts of things. And every city has their unique map of this. And if you navigate this successfully, actually your city will grow. But it's this governance structure that's enabled the great cities of today, the world cities, the New Yorks, the Londons, and actually many more US cities are, are being added to that list. Um, is because they've able within a local region to deal with that level of governance. More immediate problems, we have uh, um, 4,267 people that die prematurely every year as a result of poor air quality in London. Uh, in New York, that figures somewhere near 6,000, um, Chicago, Los Angeles, Orlando, Austin, um, Washington, DC, uh, it's in thousands. Um, people are taking regular visits to the emergency room for asthma treatments on particularly bad air days. Um, but the World Health Organization has a very clear methodology that says your, your life will be shortened if you live in a, in a big polluting city. Um, it, the good news is if you tackle the air quality emissions, the pollutants that are a result of burning gas in our cities, but also uh, traffic emissions, um, you actually deal with the big majority of the greenhouse gases as well. Um, and so why don't we tackle the thing that's killing us today to solve the thing that's gonna kill us tomorrow? It sounds mildly optimistic. Because cities are also extremely good at responding to these things. I don't know any city in the world that doesn't have a team of people putting in measures to tackle air quality. I've met them in Los Angeles and Chicago and New York and all over the US. And there's a lot of people putting in some very innovative solutions and ideas to tackle that, simply because they're aware of it, they're feeling it, and the city can react and do something about it. So what are the answers? Go back to my very early comment. In 2050, you're going to live in a city with twice as many people, and you're going to have to move those twice as many people through the city. Well, I have a solution, and this is it. So you, hopefully you like that. Um, this is oddly better than London because everyone has a seat. And um, <laughs> I could argue the same about New York as well. Um, this is uh, what we actually term today as a bus. Um, the trick is to move as many people on as few vehicles. You then have half a chance of getting people moving comfortably around the cities. Again, the great cities in the world have reacted to this. Lots and lots of buses in New York, London, um, Hong Kong, fa fabulous public transport system. Um, the key here is to think broadly about people and space and how you utilize it. Um, cycle lanes are an incredible waste of space. Uh, please don't attack me, I'm very pro cycling, but um, we give cyclists all this wonderful road space and you see very few people on it. Now, arguably it's about attracting more, more people to do it, but you could move goods and services more effectively on uh, cycle routes, really maximize the use of that space, take some of the other bigger polluting vehicles off the road. Actually, this is a fairly nice approach, people hopping on and off, uh, like a minibus um, idea. Um, this is the smart uh, version of that. Uh, how many people can you get in a smart car? Uh, as you know, the bus, bus is a fantastic device. Let me tell you, um, there are uh, around 8,000 buses in New York. Um, in Shenzhen in China, there are 14,000 buses um, and all of those 14,000 are electric, pure electric buses. In New York, there are 15, okay, one five. And I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that um, this is coming. This is a big, big trend that we're seeing. 
a big shift to electrification, not just cars, but big polluting vehicles. And this will go a long way. Um, as long as we generate the electricity renewably, we'll go a long way to also tackling the big emissions, having smoother, better journeys on the bus and uh, getting more and more people moving through the city. This is my hybrid. <laughs> Uh, so more hybrid vehicles. Actually, the US is, is extremely good in terms of uh, numbers of hybrid vehicles, um, over 5 million on the roads of the US today. Um, there are around a million electric vehicles on the roads today. It's taken about a decade to get there. Uh, in the next decades, they envisage at least 20 million more electric vehicles. I actually think that number's higher. We've seen a big, big uh, uptaking in uh, organizations making commitments to electric vehicles. The um, manufacturers are all now focusing very heavily on becoming pure electric, uh, well ahead of um, uh, the Paris Agreement. And this is an extremely good step forward as long as we think about how the batteries are made, what chemicals go in, how we, how we process and, and make all of that, how we dispose of them in the end. Um, so we have to do this right you know we have to move to this electric future but really thinking hard about um, how we make them how we dispose of them in the end uh, so that we don't just uh, build up a whole new set of future problems um 10 percent of congestion in most big cities is a result of people driving around looking for a parking space um uh, you can now with great apps uh, get yourself a parking space assigned at your destination without, um, uh, you know, having to search for it, uh, which would cut congestion by 10%. So when I said about software uh, not having uh, the ability to solve rapid urbanization, actually, it's going to have a major role in tackling things like this. And 10% reduction in congestion is huge. This gets your traffic speeds way up um, and gets people moving, buses moving and other um, forms of transport get, getting around the city. And this is uh, Bangkok uh, with their elevated train. So you can think of my solution with the Afghani truck moving through the desert. Well, this is what they did in Bangkok. They simply put an elevated train solution so they can pack those people in above. They can keep the road below, but they also put in a very uh, impressive greening um, uh, set of trees and bushes, which uh, soak up a lot of the air pollution quite effectively as well. So now you're seeing these kind of solutions that have a multitude of co-benefits for health, for um, space, for moving people, for the economy. Um, and we're seeing a lot more uh, solutions like this emerging. Um, these are trains. I'm not going to bore you. We as a company actually make these. We do all sorts of things, but um, I wanted to show you that trains are all different. They're different based on how often they need to stop and how fast they need to go. So if you have a train that doesn't need to stop much but needs to go fast, then it's very different from a train that has to stop every three minutes and goes a lot more slowly, okay? So in Mumbai, you've got multiple stops in a very dense city, but they need to carry a lot of people. Um, they don't need to go that fast because it, it's a fairly compact city. Um, big cities, compact cities are great. Let me talk about cycling. Copenhagen has 52% of its trips now done by bike, by bicycle, which is amazing. Uh, I can assure you that cities like London have 2% because they're much bigger. These distances to cycle are much greater. So these kind of uh, uh, solutions in the bottom left um, work in big cities. They can have lots of people. They can stop people up on the way. They don't need to go too fast, but they go faster than a, a, a bicycle and, and you actually arrive at work in reasonably good shape. The trend we're seeing, uh, the red line there um, is actually like this in the last five years. So what's happening is the demand for trains to stop more frequently, but go faster is now happening. And you would think that that's just 
normal innovation at work, speeding things up, enabling you know acceleration and deceleration without throwing people around the carriages. Well, that's true, but it's nothing like as steep as this. And this is the how steep that line has to start moving. So we need to think cleverly about how far technology will take us, how far good planning will take us, how big or small our cities are, what the best mode of transport we get people in. In a big exploring city like LA, it's a wonderful car city and it has amazing infrastructure for cars. Um, trying to move people over vast distances by train may not be the best solution. It's, it's part of the solution, but actually thinking about building business hubs out in the suburbs, allowing people to travel shorter distances from home to work is probably a better solution than trying to figure out how to get more and more people, increasing numbers of people from the very outside to the very inside. So there's a role for planning and a role for technology that's completely intertwined. This is the taxi of the future. It's gonna pick up more people. It's like a super Uber. It's gonna pick up more people. Uh, they exist today, of course. Um, and that driver's seat's taking up a lot of space. You could rip that out, and put more seats in, you know, we'll have this driver's future coming. Big caution here, driverless vehicles will happen last in cities, unless you make it a criminal offense to jaywalk. Because a jaywalker today runs the risk of a driver texting, not seeing them and running them over. And so they tend to wait for the crosswalk or not jaywalk. Um, imagine a future where they know that this vehicle, this computer is simply going to stop. Uh, it takes all the risk away from a jaywalker. They'll just step out into the street, but it's not two or three cars that they'll be stopping. It's two, 300. These autonomous vehicles, the whole reason for having them is that you can move vehicles closer together. So you're going to have to have very dedicated lanes that stop pedestrians crossing. It's going to lead to an awful lot of um, tight segregation in cities, um, which is going to be difficult. So uh, in mind. Um, London's energy future needs to be mapped. This is true again of any big city. I just want to show you this illustration very quickly. Um, it's an incredibly diverse city. How do you uh, send messages to a city that has over 200 languages spoken, um, communities of, of people that don't speak English particularly well? So it's about uh, dealing with this challenge, but recognizing incredibly diverse nature of cities. We need to increase tree growth in our cities. Again, the big, the best cities in the world are the ones that add street trees, add trees to the very dense centers ensure that they protect their green spaces. Um, if you covered the entire entirety of London with solar, and I'm talking about every building, every major park, so in New York, every building covers Central Park completely with solar. Um, and we studied it, 800 page study, and don't worry, here's your answer. The best amount of energy that you will give your city is 10%. 10.6%. So you can put solar everywhere, but it's not going to meet your energy needs. So we have to think about uh, wind, we have to think about nuclear, we have to think about uh, clean gas in an interim solution. But more importantly, if you double your energy efficiency measures, that 10% would immediately leap to 20. So it's not just about providing clean energy, we have to think about consuming way, way less. Um, there are many tools. London was one of the very first cities very boldly putting in a congestion price. I'm really pleased to see New York has got there. Um, I know that Eric Garcetti in Los Angeles and the uh, Metro are looking and have not ruled, ruled this out. I think it, it's an amazing step. It means the blue to pay. It. If you can afford to drive, you can afford to pay the charge. And all that money gets reinvested back into public transport infrastructure. Um, on top of that, you can put a low emission zone, which sits in a wider perimeter around the city. So you're now encouraging people to switch from gas guzzling vehicles to cleaner vehicles. So I'm a big fan of these big mechanisms that are going to push us 
uh, forward uh, because more importantly, they also generate revenue. This is uh, me back telling the mayor um, what to do. <laughs> he really never listened. Um, that's why he's now prime minister. But he um, very boldly did a lot of big projects um, across the city uh, when he was mayor of London. He did two terms, um, thought very hard about the mechanisms and tools at the disposal, protected green spaces, thought hard about balancing the economy and the environment. Um, and I think mayors of big cities have a bigger responsibility than, than presidents and prime ministers actually of uh, reacting to the needs of uh, very high populations that live within their jurisdiction. Shanghai is now doing amazing upgrades to all of its building stock to make them energy efficient, but more importantly, resilient and grid independent. They want to pull and steal businesses away from New York, uh, Chicago, London, Frankfurt, and move them into Shanghai where they can do business in these ultra secure, ultra high tech buildings with their own energy centers, uh, ensuring business continuity. Um, it's, a, it's a clever strategy. Istanbul had a building retrofit program to clean all of its buildings up, but took long term unemployed people and trained them into the green jobs. So this is using solving an environmental problem with an economic uh, gain. Uh, Moscow is building new administrative centers outside of the city. So a bit like my proposal for LA, if you pull the businesses out and the, and the offices, um, you can decongest uh, the, uh, the center of the city. And this is Buenos Aires. Uh, they're uh, making much uh, easier way of crossing these streets. Um, this kind of severance creates uh, pockets of crime in different parts of the city because they're isolated from other parts. So they've realized if they can reduce the severance, they can reduce the crime rate. And of course, that's bringing businesses back into the city. Um, this was Rome way back um, when, uh, uh, not Pope Francis, but the Pope before, Pope Benedict um, was in charge. And seven years after this picture was taken and Pope Francis came in, that was the same image. So we now have these devices. It's just incredible how they came over that period. Um, we have roughly the same number now. We just spend a lot more time on them. Um, but these devices enable us to push information to people. This is an important aspect of our future city, uh, allowing pedestrians, cyclists, drivers, inhabitants, commuters, um, to push packets of information to them that make their journey and their life better uh, in the city. Um, somebody challenged me to find a smart building, so I did. There it is. I'll come back to smart buildings. Um, let me just talk briefly, and I'm nearly done, um, about the uh, project we did as a company and part of our carbon neutral strategy, but uh, Princeton facility in uh, New Jersey, we put a distributed energy solution, the solar powers the building, it's put into the parking lot. Um, we, we, can, we did a bunch of energy efficiency measures alongside it. So you get um, more energy for your building, any surplus, of course, you can send back to the grid and sell back to the grid. Um, we've connected that to a storage system and EV chargers. Um, we wanted to prove that you can have a site completely resilient, self-reliant. Um, if the grid goes down, the site keeps going. Um, and we just, um, I believe that this is the next big thing for America. Under the Biden administration, we will see a lot more distributed energy projects rolling across, giving people that energy independence giving people more resilience um, and obviously cleaning up um, the, the energy system as well. Um, we've been successful. Uh, I just want you to know that over the years, as we're growing, um, look at North America at the top, the amount of uh, cars is reducing. So the big cities are figuring out, even as people are becoming richer and the cities are becoming bigger, they're not buying bigger, better cars they're actually figuring out 
that these cities need to shift to public transport. And actually, cities are far more efficient than the overall country um, because of that dense living, because of the way we can move multiple people around. Um, New York City, you can see, consumes far less CO2 per capita than the US overall. So city living is going to solve the climate crisis because it's far more efficient today. Um, so those lessons ought to be uh, learned and scaled back out um, to the wider communities. And this is my final, my ending. Um, these are my children. Um, uh, since that picture was taken, uh, I've gained a child and lost a chicken. Um, <laughs> but this was an experiment to show you what 80 litres of water looks like. Um, this is the um, zero carbon definition of how much water you, could, you should consume per person per day. Okay, And it sounds like a lot, given that if you drink two litres, it's a lot. But I can tell you in the US, the uh, average is 420 liters per person per day, okay? In South America, it's around 300. In, uh, even in Africa, it's around 150. Um, so we have to think about how we use our resources um, in, a, in a much better way. This gave me a great way of visualizing and thinking about how do you cut your water use in a, in, in a third, in a quarter, um, and we have to start doing that with our with our energy use as well. Uh, these are the uh, these are the kids more recently, and now you know what happened to the chicken. I'm kidding; it's a joke. So the the well is covered over, um, but the well waters the garden. And um, none of this is easy. I uh, and this is my final statement. It, none of this is easy. Um, but if you look at the data, if you look at the solutions available, the choices are actually um, pretty simple. And so while some of these projects are quite difficult to implement, the solutions are, are pretty clear. We just got to figure out how to do it. Uh, so that's my conclusion. It's not easy, but it is simple. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Martin. That was terrific. And some beautiful images and some really <laughs> thought-provoking stuff little. here. Yeah. <laughs> so I, we've already gotten some questions submitted uh, in the Q&A, but just to invite, if you haven't discovered it, uh, please go ahead and type any question you may have uh, in that. And, and I'm going to try to read these and convey them to Martin, and he'll give us some answers. So right. we've got a few so far, uh, and, and a lot of them are regarding some of uh, your comments about uh, transportation. Um, the first, uh, someone was anticipating, actually before you even showed the, the uh, shared uh, electric vehicle that you thought might eventually be autonomous, um, Jerry asked, is autonomous electric ride share like that the future of urban mobility? Uh, and how should public transportation adapt to ride sharing apps and other kind of Silicon Valley type initiatives like that? I mean, it's a, big, a big topic, but yeah. Uh, it's an awesome question. It's it's actually the question. So uh, thanks to Jerry, right? Um, so, you know, Uber, that kind of ride sharing stuff, um, it's caused a big problem for cities because they, um, they just came, didn't ask permission. They just came, they got, you know, drivers on the roads, they uh, proved that, they can bring the cost down of, of a journey, but they don't have the same considerations in their business as a city does. So they don't have to consider the environment. And I'm not saying they don't. All I'm saying is, is that they focused on what the customer wanted and they provided it and fair play to them. But it's it caused increases in air pollution across big cities. Now the future, particularly on micro mobility is good. We're learning to move people electrically in, on scooters. Um, and I can see, see that increasing already. You see them on the street corners in Atlanta, right away across to LA. This ability then for people to move across fairly big distances on a very, very small vehicle. Um, my fear for this is that you're gonna see a 
vast increase in accidents. We're already seeing it, but so if it's not regulated, if their hierarchy in the road travel is not established clearly, um, if the rules are not obeyed as we have to obey them in cars um, and um, other vehicles, um, then it's going to become difficult um, for them to keep increasing. But I'm a big fan. I think it's a good way of moving people around. Uh, if you've got good secure bike lanes, you can have micro mobility and, and bikes uh, coexisting reasonably uh, happily. Um, so that, that would be my kind of quick answer to that. I guess, do you see that, that as any threat to the, the you know, publicly supported mass transit systems or, or could those things coexist just fine? I think you, you, you absolutely will need both. Um, the New York subway, um, you know, once they clean it up, once they invest a bit more money in it, um, will bring back a lot of users that they lost to ride sharing. Yeah. So the streets of New York, uh, their congestion has increased year on year because of ride sharing. It's because it's a better alternative to going down to a, a dirty subway filled with homeless people. Um, so you're going to have to to fix that. And when you fix it, you'll pull those people back. Um, you'll make so much money that you can actually deal with the homeless um, problem properly, and give them a place to sleep and a meal to eat and so on. So you have to look at these problems from a kind of a wider economic view. And that, that's what these rideshare companies don't have to do and therefore don't. Um, but you are going to need it. I mean, London moves 25 million trips per day. I can tell you that around 4 million of those are the subway, the underground, but 5 million are by bus. Okay, so more people move by bus in London than they do underground. So wow. these big vehicles, the big trains, the light rail uh, is, is vastly important, but they should go hand in hand with getting people onto bikes and, and micro mobility. Interesting. Uh, thank you. Uh, so the next question actually wasn't about transportation. Uh, Plamen uh, has asked us about uh, some recent comments that have been made by Bill Gates uh, about the uh, prospect of switching to synthetic beef and how that could be a singular solution to some of our environmental problems. Wondering about the connection of intensive agriculture and, and urbanism. Do you have uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, um... One of the bigger, biggest emitters of greenhouse gas emissions is agriculture. Um, uh, urban demand uh, grabs it, takes a lot of food. Um, you know, people, just people, but they're living in cities. So if you treat the city as an entity, um, it's, it's to blame for that portion of, of agricultural emissions as well. Um, I've seen lots of initiatives about, you know, vegetarian Monday or vegan Monday. I've seen a lot of businesses now for office lunches, they only order vegan food. Um, I've, they ban plastics and, and other things and it's very encouraging, um, but it's not enough. Um, I, I, de dealing with agriculture, uh, dealing with people eating meat, it's tough because you're telling people how to live their life. You know, if if suddenly the energy for my home comes from a wind farm instead of a gas, I don't even know. Most people don't even know. As long as their house is heated or cooled, you're not telling me to turn my heating off. You're right. You're not affecting my life. And this is why this one's going to be uh, difficult. Um, I think what he's saying is, is that some of these synthetic alternatives are so good you wouldn't notice, so just get on and do it. And I think this is also a good thing. On the first part of that question about the link between agriculture and urbanism, um, you know, the, the world, uh, we are eroding our green spaces outside of cities. Um, we're ruining them, we are killing nature in so many ways. More species have become ex extinct in the last 30 years than in the whole history of us measuring this. Um, so, you know, keeping people confined into urban spaces and allowing um, space for agriculture is a good thing. Um, we just have to figure out um, uh, how to deal with meat. Simple as that. Yeah. Fair enough. 
So the next question, uh, Irina is asking about something that I'm keen to hear you address, which is the role of aviation. Mm. Um, obviously, you know, a lot of people flying around, at least in pre-COVID times, um, and often even commuting between cities and things like this. And I'm wondering about the, the future of aviation as we try to struggle with climate and, and air pollution. And then maybe you've thought about this in the context of your job of uh, potentially yeah. electrifying short haul flights, uh, things like that. And what do you think? Yeah, so um, the, the problem with aviation um, is people say, hey, with COVID, nobody's flying. This is great for the environment. Um, when we were flying, aviation accounted roughly for 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, you know, our buildings are uh, around 40%. So my argument would be, it's a tough problem to tackle, but it's not a big problem in the grand scheme of, of what we're facing. Um, that said, we should tackle it. Um, a lot of the airlines are now thinking about the journey from getting a passenger from their home to getting them to their destination. So they are encouraging people to take public transport. All of the ground uh, equipment that pulls your plane out and tugs your plane onto the runway, um, all of these things are switching to electric. They're now looking at making at least the first few minutes and the last few minutes of your flight uh, electrically powered. Um, in order to reduce the actual air quality emissions that fall over big urban areas. And I know that Airbus and others are investing very, very heavily in the future of aviation to make flight um, uh, purely electrical. Um, the airlines, 98% of their operational costs are aviation fuel. So it's everything I've just said about getting the journey to the airport and the tugs and whatever is actually a tiny part of the problem. Um, and aviation fuels, um, you know, the, the, the sustainable aviation fuels are in about 10% better. So that's already a, a big improvement, but it's a long way to go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fair enough. So I think uh, I'm going to jump to Dele's question, which is, I think, was on my mind as you were talking to about some of the distributed uh, energy resources. Um, the current situation in Texas um, and, and other parts of the country, too, for that matter, during this winter weather uh, and the failure of some of the grids has been getting a lot of attention. And he's asking in particular about whether the vision you laid out of a, a more dense city in the future might make these kinds of uh, outages, uh, you know, failures of our systems even more dangerous and how you know, we might work to make those things more resilient and secure. Yeah, uh, well, absolutely, yes. I mean, the grid is, is the constraint. Um, most grids, not, not just in the US, but globally have had too little investment. Um, over the years and therefore their, their reliability is uh, and overall resilience is not good. Um, you know, if you look back to Superstorm Sandy when they flooded uh, lower Manhattan, it was the 14th Street substation that just got overwhelmed. Um, the water went over the bund wall. Uh, it never happened before. Um, now they've built the wall higher, but that water has come in at that height since then. So the, these aren't 100 year events, they are you know, 10 year events, five year events. So the frequency is a lot higher. Um, if you look at, and many studies have been done, but if you look at um, the, the resilience aspect of cities, decentralizing from the grid um, is a really great way to go, especially now that we are um, sending power in two directions. So the grids were designed to push power to people's homes. Now we're turning our homes and buildings into mini power stations and exporting power back to the grid. Um, it's causing a lot of destabilizing um, of the grid. Uh, what would be better is that they're completely islanded from the grid. So our Princeton site, the one I showed, is completely disconnected if we, if we need to can go in island mode um, when the grid doesn't operate 
we we just run along and 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 uh, keep going. So I really can see it. Um, it makes sense. It's easy to do. Um, I often took the train from New York to DC and looked at all of the train stations and all the business parks along the way and thought this is the time to cover these parking lots with solar panels because for these they've got the space and the ability to um, you know power those buildings uh, across that whole journey um, what you're seeing in in Texas is is um, a direct result of of underinvestment in grid uh, reliance on a centralized system. Um, we need to start having more and more hubs off that system that can operate independently. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I, I think that it definitely gets to it. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Okay, good. Good. We've got a, a question here that I get a lot, and I'd be curious to hear what you have to say on this too. Um, you know, a lot of people care a lot about these issues, but they feel like they're not sure what they as an individual can do to make the biggest dent in, in problems of sustainability. Um, you have something you typically say when you get this kind of question? Um, you mean, what can I do, the individual? Yeah, yeah, yeah. like in, in your daily life. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people, um, we, we uh, I'll answer this with a quick, I know we've got a couple of minutes. A quick, um, we did a study for Eric Garcetti in Los Angeles to, to show that, you know, his very aggressive climate plan to deliver 100% electric vehicles and 100% renewable energy by 2050 was doable. And we showed the technology pathway for it. And um, I think a lot of people assume that you just put a few solar panels and a couple of parking lots and you're there, you know, and I've, showed you in the presentation that if you covered London, every building and every park, you, you get about 10%, something like that. Um, so we, what the first thing as an individual is to just figure out what your contribution is, which is fairly easy to do. You can Google that. Um, and how you can consume less um, of, of what you do. I live in a house that is run on a heat pump, air sourced heat pump. Uh, this is relatively easy to do um, and I buy a green electricity tariff so I have no fossil fuels in my house we cook on electric and it's completely fossil free and independent um, so a lot of people could do that I mean it costs money I get it but come off your gas boiler switch to something more mm -hmm. renewable think about your journeys do you need to do them reduce the number of journeys you do but um, you know think about public transport but most importantly is speak to your local representative and yell at them and scream at them and tell them we want cleaner buses or better buses or more reliable buses. Why can't my bus stop have a time that shows me that it's three minutes away so that you know I can plan my journey and connect that to my phone. And none of this is rocket science. That's easy to do. So my answer to this is um, complain, yell at your local representative tell them what a good solution would look like because actually they're pretty good at taking those ideas and, and, and making them work. Yeah, that's a great answer. I, I do often arrive at the, your voice and your vote are the, the most powerful things you can do. Uh, well, so and, we've and, got uh, Jack said about the hydrogen, I'm just saying that yes to hydrogen, by the way, hydrogen buses would be awesome, big trucks, big vehicles, much more attuned to hydrogen. And again, you're not reliant on producing electricity Hydrogen can be derived from food waste and all sorts of other things. So within an urban environment, again, diversity of those kind of sources, awesome. So yes to Jack. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna say, I, we have a bunch of really great questions here, but I know we're running low on time. Maybe I can take one more and, uh, and then we can wind up or? I'm fine, um, I, it's okay with me, yeah. Yeah, or, or if, if you're a game, we could stick around for a few more minutes, but. Um, so Hayden uh, is asking about street parking and, and your thoughts about trying to eliminate the street parking as a way to force people into other modes of transport in cities. Is this a good idea? No, no, it's a good idea. Um, you, you have to do it slowly. You know, again, if you suddenly ban street parking and you, you, you've lived in the city for years and you own a car and suddenly you can't 
go to your friend's house and park on the street outside. Um, you may leave the city. You may go, I'm going to go live in Atlanta or I'm going to. So the, and, and that's a real worry for big cities. I mean, New York, I read in the New York Times that they've lost 50,000 people. This is the year before COVID. Um, and a lot of people put that down to congestion from ride sharing and traffic speeds and other things that uh, they just didn't like. So it doesn't take much to push people away. It is a good idea. You have to allow delivery vehicles to drop things off. So there's, you know, you can't reclaim parking space, but by eliminating the parking, you would help the flow of traffic or reducing the parking. So over time you could cut it down. Um, generally, if you take something away from somebody, you have to give them something back in return. So if you're going to stop me getting in my car with a congestion price, for example, and removal of the parking space, um, then you have to make sure that the subway is fit for me to ride every day, or that you give me a bus that I can get on and it takes me on the way. Yeah. And I think this is, a, you know, again, the, the big cities have, have figured that out. They've figured out that you, you've got to give people an alternative if you take something away from them. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, so maybe as a last question, uh, I'll pose one that, you know, the, the Solutions That Scale initiative, which this seminar is related to, is a, is a nascent effort here that is really trying to, to bring together strands of different research disciplines, but also folks like yourself in the corporate world, as well as people making decisions in government. And, and I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how cooperation going forward to meet these challenges should be trying to, to pull all those strands together of the, the business leaders, as well as the cities and the, the national level government and academics, like a lot of us on the call here. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I go back to these, um, our Princeton Island grid example. Um, this is looking at government electricity tariffs. It's looking at the local community um, as a business, we look to do it. There's lots of suppliers involved in, in doing that. Um, this was a multi-partner game that we've played to build that one facility. What it's taught us is that the incentives from government could be better. The partners could be more incentivized to provide the technology at a cheaper price. And again, there's a role for government in that as well which would encourage more and more of these um, units to go up. Um, electricity is um, uh, cheap in the US. And I think that's a good thing, by the way. A lot of people say, unfortunately, electricity is so cheap that you know, these systems become expensive to implement. Um, cheap electricity is not a bad thing. It keeps fewer people out of fuel poverty. Um, means they can heat their homes properly, you know, heat their, keep their children warm and at night or, or cool in hot summers. Um, but we need to look at incentives that therefore bring the technology price down that uh, enable local manufacturing, which I know is a big point for the US right now. Um, and that's all of that requires partnerships. Um, and I, what's great to see about the Biden administration um, is they didn't just re-sign back into the Paris Agreement. They've made, and on that very first day, the executive orders were um, about cleaning up the grid. So there's these there's a whole range of interim targets that have been set, which I think will help hugely. But I think there's going to also need to be um, other incentives like feed-in tariffs potentially that help make putting solar panels on a domestic house easier and cheaper to do as an alternative to uh, what's there right now. Um, but for businesses, I think a lot is there. I think this is a solution that will scale, which is why I've kind of picked it as a key um, point that I'm raising. But again, the, each state um, has to look at 
the players, the individual players that need to come together to make that work. I know that there are lots of for, a, for universities that come together and talk about how they green their campus and they're making huge uh, steps forward by working together collaboratively um, and learning about how they're doing it. Um, I think other small businesses should do the same. I think there are you know peer-to-peer -peer networks which really support this this kind of thing. And um, obviously, your your initiative is 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 clearly focused on how do you bring the partners together um, to make these solutions uh, attractive for others. Um, so distributed energy solutions for me is that. Excellent. Well, it's good to hear that you think it's worthwhile and, and has a future. Um, so we'll, I, I think we should just wrap up there. We're a few minutes over time. I appreciate you uh, bearing with us. I'm sorry to folks who didn't get their questions answered, but uh, it was a great uh, talk. I really enjoyed hearing your perspectives and grateful you spent the time, Martin. So yeah, thank you. Very happy. And if, if people want to email me with their questions, I'm also subsequently happy to, to give you a response. Oh, that's that's generous of you. Maybe some <laughs> folks will take you up. <laughs> Great. Please All right. Thanks. Bye so now, much. everyone. Thanks, everyone.